Welcome, everyone. So excited to be here today to do this uh, upside down demo. Uh, this is something that I've been doing for many years. It's something that I love to do, and it really has a purpose. Uh, as Carolyn Anderson says, she thinks, unfortunately, too many artists are trapped into just painting things. Well, guess what? When you paint upside down, you trick your brain. And that's, that's the whole goal. Your brain can't identify with things, and so it stops you from painting things. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing, really, when you're out, outdoors playing or painting. You're painting shapes, mass, values, colors, and you're painting edges and doing all of that. You're really painting a non-objective painting because your brain doesn't identify stuff. It's amazing when you're painting right side up how your brain's going to tell you, well, you better make sure that that bow of that ship looks right. You know, you better make sure they know those are sails. You better make sure that's a buoy and they know what it is. Whatever. Your brain tries to uh, make sure because the brain thinks that's its duty to keep you in control. But, op but actually the opposite is this. You're tricking your brain and your brain can't attach to a thing so it has to start working on what you're really trying to copy uh, and, and, and accomplish. So what we've done here today, which is real exciting for me, I, I've, I've got, I always do this when I do upside down. I have a black and white, uh, and then I have a grid. Uh, sometimes I have a grid, sometimes I won't. I just wing it and just sort of get it in the right places. I, it, the painting has a totally different feel. But nevertheless, they were never at that side anyway. They don't know what it looks like. And also, too, this is one of the great advantages of doing landscapes. It's so, you so, have so much more freedom to do landscapes than you do when you have to do portraits or figurative. Because when you do portraits and figures, boy, we got anatomy to deal with. And the anatomy, if you're going to try to be a, a, a halfway decent representational artist, You've got to get that anatomy right or it doesn't work. Like you can't have one eye down here, one over here, your nose up in your forehead. You know, that's the whole, that's the whole point about that. So, so when you do landscape, you really have a lot of wiggle room. That might be one of the reasons why landscape painting is so uh, enormously populated. Uh, because they don't have those restrictions and rules and regulations that you have to do when you do with the figure and or the face. So anyway, enough about that. But uh, what I'm going to do here today is something that I haven't done with my upside down paintings in many, many years. Back in, uh, when was it? Back in 80... Mm, 84, 83, when we went to Switzerland, I took a bunch of, of course, a bunch of shots, and I actually plain air painted there, which was so much fun. It was my first plain air experience, and I didn't know anything about plain air painting other than I set up out there and tried to paint a painting, and I did two paintings. But uh, what... What I did was I, I did two 8 by 10 upside down paintings and I put a grid 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Divided it up into 12, uh, actually because it wasn't a square, it was a rectangle, so I had 12 little rectangles. And I started at the top, one across, then came to the next row, one across, then I... As I was doing, I was so excited, I couldn't wait to turn that thing up right side up to see what it was looking like. But I said, no, the rules are 
you don't do that you just do it and exercise your faith and see what it's going to happen and so I was so thrilled I just couldn't wait when I got the last one done I turned it right side up and I was shocked at how how the painting turned out it turned out really great for me we even way back then because I didn't know a lot about plein air painting and I didn't know a lot about actually doing fine art I was an illustrator for 30 years so I got the message from the Lord this morning hey look I think it'd be a great idea why don't you just do this grid by grid I'll paint this section first I'll go here I'll go here then I'll go there 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 that's the plan I might for some reason just skip and go to another one uh, because the point is I'm gonna have to finish them all now what will happen and can happen is because you're painting section by section and I've already thought about this with the sky I thought I would just go ahead and do the whole sky because it's all the same value and get that done but I thought no you know I'm not going to because I'll have a sort of a sky pot mixed up but I might tint it a little bit different in this rectangle and keep the value the same and tint it different over here and then after I get through the whole thing and I come back I can piece some things together I can piece that together so what I will have is a hue slight hue transition but not a value shift which will give that painting uh, of the sky a, a very interesting effect instead of just painting a one, va one value and one color all the way the cross you know I could trans trans uh, translate from a a cooler to not quite as cool to warmer uh, in those shoes that would be a logical thing to do or maybe just wing it and just do whatever so anyway that's the whole thing about it and I'm really excited to do this because I'm gonna have so much fun and I and I'm really counting on it the painting's gonna turn out and be very interesting I want it to have a lot of an emotion and, and a lot of motion these waves crashing and splashing up on the rocks and everything it's gonna be uh, it's going to be really uh, a fun subject to paint and uh, I'm going to really do the marbleizing if you can see down here in my uh, I'm using the help of an iPad because I can blow up this square here is right here and so this is kind of nice because I can assimilate the pieces of paint and as you can see the marbleizing and the striations of different things that are happening with the brush in there instead of just a flat color and I'll show you in that how I dip into uh, color and uh, and get that happening what's really kind of exciting uh, and I've learned this from all the years of teaching uh, I've said to the students in many different classes unfortunately I tell them your palette is much more interesting and exciting than your painting and a lot of that was because they were just concerned about mixing paint and not trying to make anything out of that other than mixing paint but the mixing of the paint homogenized uh, and unified the color in the palette and they had a lot of exciting things going on it was a beautiful abstract and their painting was a really boring over labored realistic painting which I uh, which I had to help them with in that workshop so those are some exciting things for me as an artist uh, to do and again I'm only I'm not going to this is just the starting place in this square 
I'm not going to try to get it exact. That would be copying. Why put yourself in prison? It's not about copying. It's about creating. So I'll mimic this and mimic the values. And then the thing is, after when we get to the point when I've covered up all the squares and we turn it right side up, then I can start, your eyes don't lie, they will tell you what to do, they will tell me to do based on all the mileage that I've had in painting on what needs attention and what doesn't. And hopefully I'll be diligent in doing that. So, so that's, that's what we're going to try to accomplish. And that's the way we're going to do it. That's the way we're going to roll. And I think it's going to be really exciting uh, for you guys to witness this and see it. And then I hope it's a big encouragement for you guys to try this, to do these paintings upside down in your studio because it is such a freeing experience and it's so much fun. It's just absolutely a blast. What do you got to lose? Go for it. Okay, let's start with the paint. I use my good buddy, uh, Michael Harding. Uh, his paint is phenomenal. It's like butter. It works well. It works well with any medium you're going to want to try to use it with. He told me I met him at uh, Eric's Plain Air Convention out of Monterey. We were doing a, uh, a podcast thing together, Michael Harding, him talking about paint, me talking about painting. And then after he finished, he said, I want you to try my paint. He said, it will literally change your life. <laughs> and I thought, oh boy, here we go. I've heard that again. But he was right. I did two demos there with his paint and fell in love with it. So we're going to be using Prussian blue today. Naphtha Red, Michael Harding's, Cadmium Lemon Yellow, and I use Windsor Newton Griffith Alkids. Michael Harding has this stuff uh, as well, too, but I've just been using this for, all, for years and years. I just keep doing it. And then Lamp Black for my convenience color. What I'm basically... Uh, uh, doing is I, I went to the triune, I call it the triune, uh, uh, palette, uh, because it simplifies everything. And I'm just amazed at how every, uh, the colors, uh, homogenize better. The, the colors are unified. Uh, it, it just keeps your painting really united you know it's pretty hard to make a mistake with a with a, a three color palette and again i just use black especially in here for the demos because it's my convenience color meaning i can gray down the chromas in any of the three other colors yellow blue or red i can gray them down uh with the black actually black and black and yellow make a really beautiful green a different green than your uh uh, Prussian blue and yellow make. That'll be a much stronger, powerful. So that's that. The brushes are my wonderful friend, Rosemary and Simi, Rosemary Brush Company. And of course, the Monday Mops. This, this brush is the most, in my opinion, is the most versatile brush you can ever get and paint with because it's a lay-in brush par excellence, especially with a little Neo McGilp to thin your paint down just a tad. Great lay-in brush, a great b brush to actually make strokes that count uh, when you're further along in your painting, and it's a great edge, uh, an enormous edge brush because you can come between the two lines and you can hit that, clean your brush and hit that and soften it. You can actually create a hard edge with even as clumsy as this brush looks, you can create a hard edge with it. Uh, 
and get a straight edge with it too. And then of course this is my standby and I love this brush. It's it's Rosemary's uh, uh, Badger Fan Series number 37. It's the largest fan brush she makes. But look how thick. Here's, here's my finger. It's as thick as my finger and it really works wonderful. You take a uh, and when you when you're painting you want to stay out of the gam saw and I'll show you here like like with Kleenex you just after you use it you can do this and get most of the paint out of there and then you're ready to do it again when you're doing the painting now when you're going to clean it it's a different story you only want to stick this into your gam saw container just the top area because that's the only place where the paint is. Keep the gam saw off of this area. You don't want it near the ferrule, which is this metal thing that holds the bristles and the hairs in there. You don't want to get it in there because that gam saw will get in there. It'll start dissolving the glue and pretty soon you'll have clumps of this falling out and you'll run your brush. The hair is my my mirror I like to do that when I'm plein air painting people think I'm looking at myself <laughs> but really mirrors are essential why because you're painting at such a rapid rate that it's very hard for you to be objective it's it's really hard to be objective because your, br your brain is focused on that. You keep seeing that. You've been staring at it for 25, 30, 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, whatever, whatever period it takes to do that painting. And the objectivity falls way away because you're, you're mesmerized by exactly what you're seeing and you can't see anything else. And you certainly don't see the problems, a lot of problems, that you will find out you can have in your composition when you turn around and look at it in reverse it's tricking your brain it's like what I'm doing with the grid and painting upside down I'm tricking my brain which is a good thing and same thing with the mirror your mirror sees it for the first time in a total reverse and then you know it's like if you're in a still life you might have the vase tilted and you didn't your brain didn't record that and you turn it up turn it in reverse and you see oh that's and then you straighten it up it might be passages that stand out uh that that aren't working for your painting that you didn't notice i've got a big rolling mirror but for this shoot and everything because of all the equipment that we've got here in my studio uh, I'm just going to do the hand mirror like I do. This is, uh, it's called a paint uh, shaper. And uh, actually it's a squeegee. Look at that. See how flexible that is? It's really wonderful. And sometimes you want to go in there and you want to either scrape something back. You can do that with your palette knife for this or you can push it forward. There's four different sizes and uh, it just depends on what I think I want to do. And then it's like a doctor when he's performing surgery, he's got all of his tools laid out there. And when he's going to do such and such, he, he grabs that one. When he needs to do something differently, he grabs that one. I've mixed up, I learned a long time ago from Donald Put Putman and Scott Christensen when I took his first workshop about pot colors, uh, painting pots of color. In other words, you pre-mix them. So I pre-mixed the sky right here. When you're painting plain air, you can hold your brush, your palette knife right up to the what you're looking at and the sunlight will give you on that paint that you've got on there either you've got the value nailed in the color or you don't and then you mix it until you do you can do that with your iPad because the light is coming from the other way 
and so you can hold your uh, hold your palette knife on that with a paint and match it up. So then I've got my uh, dark parts of my rock uh, pots mixed up. I've got some dirty greens, a little bit of reddish. I got plenty of white, and then I've got this in here. So. Uh, I'll do this, uh, just, I'm not going to start the painting, but I'll do this, I'll show you. So you dip in, you know, your pot color, you dip into that, you dip into that. And then look what happens. Of course it wouldn't work. Can you see that, the beginning of that mark, you can see the striation, the pigment of color. Let's do it again. This is uh, my term, marbleizing paint. I love, let's just do it again. Yeah, there's a good example, look at that. That's what you want to do. You want to marbleize the paint as much as you can. Why? Because it gives you a beautiful, uh, first of all, the palette knife, the wonderful thing about that tool is you can only control it to a certain extent, and that's the whole point of it. You, you only want to put the passage where you need to put it and that's it, but you don't know how the paint's going to come off of that. It all has to do with your pressure, the angle of the blade, and everything. So, let's get going, and let's get started on the painting, man. I cannot wait. I'll be using a combination of the brush, the palette knife, Kleenex, whatever. <laughs> let's go, baby. All right, here we go. Just get her done. Just messing the paint. Like I said, I'm only going to do the first square. You know what? I think I might change my mind. And I think I'm just, because this is, I'm just going to go straight across there and just go ahead and get this done, get it out of the way. That'll make the thing work faster. Now, as I said, I can slightly change the hue, which I just did. See how it's warmer? But it's the same value. So let's see, the light is coming as I'm looking upside down, it's a little bit more like kind of a top light, so it won't make that much difference. What I'll do is I'll take this and I'm going to, I'm going to take it into a more of a, whoa, I got a little carried away. Black is. You're not supposed to be there. Why well, that really warmed up? Let's see what happens. See, I've got three different patches. So 
So this is a good thing because uh, what you need sometimes is you don't need a value shift. You just need a hue, a, a color shift. I'm so glad I got that changed my mind and did this because this will save us time and it's going to work. And I want this, to, you can see, see I've got, I've got a little texture going on in there and that's the wonderful thing. This mop brush is just, just wonderful. And we'll see how that's going to turn out. Now, out of that pile, I can come in here. And get the, uh, the water. It's a little bluer. And it's a little too dark. And I don't want any edges. A little greener. Actually, I've got a little bit more of a value contrast. Maybe I ought to darken that up just a tad. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do the same thing that I did with the sky make this water have a continuity. I'm just going to do that across there. Bust it up a little bit. I'm going to make a little bit of a color shift. Well, I'm going to have one, one sixth of the painting done in five minutes. Isn't that wonderful? Now, since I tinted that sky a little with the red, I'm going to do that down there and mimic that down in the water. That'll give me a little hue change. That, that line being changed 
and not repeat it to give it a different rhythm is going to be really nice in the overall uh, in ocean scenes a lot of time your biggest problem when you're painting the ocean scenes you've got a real hard because it appears that way you've got a real hard edge at that horizon line well the problem with that is you can't get away from it uh, and then that that is really dictating to your eye how you're looking at that thing and it's taken away even though the values are close if you have a straight hard line there that painting is going to have a whole different feel so it's better to lose that edge like that That's really a pretty cool sky, I think. That was kind of a nice stroke. I don't want to get too too much chroma though going uh Like John Michael Carter says, pieces of paint. He's a wonderful friend of mine. He and Barbara. Love those guys. And what's wonderful about painting this way, you know that when you turn it right side up, if things aren't working the way that you want them, then, you know, you fix it. It's really... Nothing more than playing in paint. It's so much fun. It's just like, this is like finger painting. I bet Scott, who's filming this, he said he was really excited to see this happen, and I bet he wished that he was sitting here doing this instead of me. Just piecing things together. Let's see, I'll go in here with, I'll do this a little faster. 
I'm going to dip down into that because I just want to make that one passage. You know, rules are there to be broken. You're literally just putting pieces of paint together. I come in here with this pure, pure white. Clean my brush. It's kind of nice. Water spilling. That was a neat move. Another nice one. Got some stuff going on. Look at that nice little abstract. Okay, now, guess what, baby? We're in number two. So I look at that for a minute, see what I've done. I've taken that out a little bit more towards the greens and some of the browns in there. So I just can't tell you how much fun this is doing this. If you guys You don't know what you're missing. Again, remember you're only You're only trying to duplicate and get an impression of what what's there. And then we just connect that up. Okay, I've got kind of a chocolate. I'm going to add a little black in there. Tone it down a little bit. Oh, it's a little too dark.
It's so good to have all these, these aids. This big thing to look at. Uh, and then this, which was from the original, original painting. Sometimes, you know, if you're going to paint photorealistic, then you can get trapped into trying to duplicate that. I don't care about duplicating that. I want that shape is what I want. And then this gets really busy in here. So, and I'm going to simplify this big mass and shape when I get to that. Introducing C.W. Mundy, a highly sought-after master landscape painter who has taken the classic technique of upside-down painting and brought it current with his techniques, hints, and tips. When you turn the canvas and the photograph upside down, your brain no longer recognizes things and has to follow you when you're painting. It has to identify shapes, values, colors, your paint manipulation, and your edges. CW's method not only eliminates stress, anxiety, and hesitation in your painting process, but it also helps you develop your own style and approach to creating art. You're tricking your brain, which is a good thing, because it stops you from painting things. With Painting with Freedom, you'll learn how to create paintings that have depth, movement, and energy and you'll have the freedom to express your unique artistic vision. Painting things can be an extravaganza of the mind going off and wandering off into areas and putting things in uh, that don't need to be there. When you experience painting upside down, you're gonna find out how much fun it is. I mean, it is a blast. Don't miss this opportunity to learn from one of the greatest landscape painters of our time. Order Painting with Freedom today and start painting with freedom. Music and art have such a such a relativity uh, in them. You know, the only, one is audio music, and the other is visual, which is painting. Uh, for example, you know, a, a, a linear line, uh, you know, that I just part, probably played would be too much unity if you just go. Okay, which could be a, a fairly good jazz line that you might be able to use. But it might be better if you broke it up like this. All right. So you get variety so that the notes just don't come out monotonous. And it's the same thing with paint manipulation. You know, you have to have a variety of brushwork. It has to be unified, but you, but you also want to have variety in it, just like you want to have variety audially with your ears. Visually, you want to have that variety, as much variety as you can get away with and still have it connected. You know, I've... Uh, 
I've enjoyed a life of art and music together. Actually, the music, I had a music career before I really had an art career. And that got busted up by circumstances. One of our band members uh, was dying of Hodgkin's disease, and that was the end of the dream. But God really spoke to me that night as I was crying in my buddy's little sport car because I knew the dream was over, and God said, you know, you're going to become an artist, and that's going to be your livelihood. You're not going to have to depend on four other band members. And that was not really what I wanted to hear because I was so in love with doing the music and performing. But that's exactly what happened. And I'm so grateful for it. And so the art and the music go hand in hand. One echoes the other. And in that time period from that was, that was about 1975 when we had our professional band, we were getting ready to record with MCA. They just hired Elton John. We were gonna be the next nitty gritty dirt band. Our band was called the Tarzan Swing Band. We wrote all of our material. We had five different lead voices and we were a show band to boot. So it was very, uh, uh, very much uh, in demand and, and it was uh, something that really had a lot of sellability. But, you know, God had this other idea for me and it was really the art. And so, you know, I left California, came back. I started a sports art corporation, painted the NBA superstars and things like that. And, uh, and went from, from that, I uh, did a lot of things with the Olympics, uh, uh, with uh, the PGA and various uh, sporting organizations and uh, went on to becoming uh, a fine artist, left illustration, became a fine artist. And that's when the plein air painting started happening. After having a couple of workshops, I studied with uh, uh, my good brother in Christ, Dan Gerhardt's, and I studied with Scott Christensen. And then my wife and I went to Europe and painted a whole collection called the Passage de France Plein Air in, uh, in France for a month and a half. And that's really where I got my feet wet in plein air painting. And this was really what launched my whole career was, was the plein air painting. And that's one of the reasons it's so special to my heart and my wife's heart because uh, getting in the outdoors and painting like the old guys did uh, was so exciting and stimulating and uh, I'm just really grateful for it. And from that catapulted me into becoming a studio painter and, and learning how to settle down and, and work, work out situations from the plein air paintings and make them more involved where you can spend more time because in plein air painting, really you've got a range, you've got a two, maybe, maybe a two and a half window where the, if the certain times of the day in the middle part of the day where you're going to be able to uh, uh, authenticate a painting. It's one thing to do that and learn from that, and it's another thing to take that knowledge and wisdom and having to paint fast and take it in the studio to slow down, uh, make more varied choices. Uh, I think of an artist like Daniel Sprick, uh, you know, once said that, you know, he, he does a painting and that painting sits in his studio for a year. And why does it? Because he turns it against the wall and doesn't look at it for a long time. And then he pulls it back out and he goes, ah, I know what I think I want to do. And uh, my good brother, uh, Dan McCall, and his son Danny and John do the same thing in their studio. They've got a stack of paintings, a stack of 80, a stack of 30, a stack of 14, a stack of 47. They've got a whole wall. And Dan shows up to work, Danny and John, they show up to work, they flip through the paintings and they go, 
That one catches my eye and I know what I think I want to do. And so then they take it out and then they work on it. And if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, that's fine. They put it back in the stack and bring it out another day and try something different. That's a direction that I'm going to go with my studio work now that I've realized that I've, I've uh, authenticated a career by doing a painting and I can do one in 15 minutes. I can do one in a half an hour. I can do one in 45 minutes. I can do one in an hour and a half, two and a half. A larger painting, four hours, maybe six hours. But I do it and I do it to bring it to completion and then you can take the piggy to market. And that's been fine and it's served me well for over the years, but, but now what I think I uh, uh, want to do is to start out, get starts on, on five or six canvases, maybe ten canvases only a start, come back and then let the painting tell me what to do. That's something that's in my future that I'm really excited about, but, but I really am in love with plain air. Some of the real benefits of plain air painting are just being in the out of doors. Uh, I love being out in the out, outdoors. I, I love it. Sometimes it's the silence. I know one thing that I got really accustomed to when I was in Europe was uh, first they were annoying all of the motorcycles because everybody's on motorcycles there. But then I got to love it. You know, I feel kind of bored all, if for. 15 or 20 minutes, I didn't hear a motorcycle, but that motorcycle meant life, meant somebody's going to do something, they're going somewhere from point A to point B. It doesn't bother me, uh, it's, it's kind of like white noise that's in the background that reminds me that I'm outside and then sometimes, you know, you hear the birds chirping early in the morning those kind of things. Uh, you have so much different lighting that's going on outdoors. You've got overcast uh, where, where you can paint. If you've got a big globe of cloud cover over, you can paint you know, for hours upon hours because the light's not going to change that much. And then you've got times that are interesting where you've got 15 seconds of sunlight and then you've got 30 seconds of cloud cover. So you learn to make the decision. I'm gonna, you know, I'm painting outdoors here and I'm painting with the sunlight. So what I, what I should, well, all only time that I can really draw the values and pull values when the sunlight is out there. You can't paint the painting in cloud cover and, uh, and full sunlight at the same time. And so you learn these things. I think, Plain air painting is such a great teaching uh, situation for all artists. And I think it's a very, very immense, important part in learning to paint from life outdoors and learning how to enjoy that instead of it being uh, so uncontrollable that you you know you're freaked out but the more mileage you have in doing that the better off you can articulate my whole painting journey started when i was a young little boy i'd sit on my father's lap and uh, he was a big strapping strong guy my height but built much more of a athletic body and i would sit there and squeeze his left bicep because he was left-handed he had his big tattoo on there from from the army and I'd sit there and squeeze his muscle and my dad would be sitting, even though he's left-handed, and be doodling and doing stick figures and all kind of stuff and just doodling with his right hand. And so like any young son would want to do the, you know, we always want to emulate our, our parents. So that was what really got me started. So I started doodling. And that was, uh, that was the beginning of my my art career on the music side, my grandmother played for the silent movies uh, in Indianapolis downtown at the Circle Theater, uh, one of the most important theaters in Indianapolis, and then the Irvington Theater, and she played ragtime 
piano and stuff like that to back up for the silent movies. And so when I went over to her house, uh, their home, when I was real little, my grandma would walk up to her, her uh, stand-up piano there against the wall and she'd start playing and she'd start play that, playing me that ragtime. And to this day, I couldn't figure out how she knew at that young age, because I was probably only four, four or five, and she was doing things with her left hand and making notes with that and doing things with her right hands and they were working together. I could see there wasn't a struggle and it, was, it just amazed me that a human being could do that. And so I was really influenced by that, but my father had other ideas. Uh, his son was gonna be an athlete, which I ended up playing high school and college basketball but his son was not gonna play the piano because that was old school to him that his, his son was gonna be an athlete and, and uh, the piano was for the woman, you know. But my grandmother had other ideas and she bought me my first Arthur Godfrey <laughs> ukulele. And so I got to thumping around on that, learning chords and I played that and then it wasn't long after that my father bought me my first four string tenor guitar, which was strong like the ukulele, but a bigger sound, a longer neck. Uh, and so I started doing that, and then that graduated into my father bought me my first 12-string guitar. I wanted that because the birds, you know, back in the 60s, back when I was in uh, college, they, the 12 string was really popular. Then I got a six string and then my father ended up buying me my first five string banjo. So the art and the music came at different times, but sort of symbiotic in that one would lead, the other would happen, and the other would get back to that. And that's always been my life, bouncing back and forth. And actually it's a wonderful rest thing to to you know, now be painting, paint for two or three hours, and then you're done. You cleaned up, and you come back, and then I get out the five string and 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 play with it. I'm, I've said many times, one of my quotes is, "I'm just a child trapped in an adult body. I just want to see what I can get away with," and that's my attitude. As long as it's moral, that's my attitude, and I always want to keep that attitude. I just turned 77 November 1st, and if the Lord gives me a, a longer life, that always I want to have that heart of a child, that investigative. You know, when a when a child's young, he he doesn't know anything about anything, and everything is a new experience, and that's the way it should be for an artist. Uh, as they continue on their art journey or their music journey. You've got to go out on the branch to the left or the right and get out of your sweet spot and be challenged with things and it, and it breaks off the dead branches and brings on new life and is really exciting. So the, the art and the music career has been developed out of time put in musically and painting artistically. The future for me as an artist, uh, people have asked me, and, and I have such a good pat answer, and it's true. They go, CW, what's the, what's, what is, if you could say, what is your, the most fa favorite painting you've ever done? Do you have that, what, what, how would you answer that? And I look at them and I said, well, the answer is probably not what you would expect, but my answer is the next one. And that's that whole attitude of the painting experience, the journey, even what I went through today, there was a journey for, for two, two hours. There was a journey. As I talked through it, there was a journey. And that's what the whole experience is about. It's the same thing with playing playing the music, it's a journey. One of the great, greatest jazz five string banjo players, uh, Patrick Allen Cloud, who is a very, very close friend of mine, told me that shocked me, he said, CW, 
what I like about you that you're so blessed with create, creatively wise is you don't know music theory and you don't have to. You, you poke and pick and do this and that and then you have to come up finding sounds that will work together and that's how you've created and he said what a great thing is to stumble onto majestic phrases that that can come off of your banjo instead of having to get it by uh, by a process of theory that that whole discovery thing is a big part of my life and that's what my future is in painting it's the discovery factor and the journey of going out on a limb. Uh, I don't want to repeat the same things over and over and over, and I haven't in my career. I've, I paint the big three, still lifes, figurative, and uh, landscapes. And one, I paint a series of those, the pen is empty, I move on to the next. Then I move on to the next, and then I come back to the first. So it's just a nat natural evolution over a period of time. And uh, that's what keeps you fresh. Some people I know aren't wired that way. They don't want to go on an adventure because they're in love with what they've done for 20 years. And that's fine and dandy for them. Hallelujah. I'm glad that they're excited in what they do. But for me, it's all about the adventure and the the adventure that I can find enraptured in, enveloped in, uh, going off on, on tangents. I think uh, one of the things that is very important advice that I would give to artists that want to uh, experience growth in that is, first of all, you need to paint from your heart. You don't need a gallery telling you, well, you know, those, uh, those paintings, those red roses sold, you know, bam, just like that. Can you do me two or three more? You need to stay away from those kind of galleries and those situations. You need to paint what's coming out from inside and get it out on your canvas. I can remember when I was much younger, I was really afraid, when I say much younger, I'm 77, but back in the you know, when I was in my 40s, I was really afraid to make myself transparent to an audience because I really didn't know if what I was going to share with them was going to be right based on art history or be right or whatever. I was really afraid, but the more, the more that I dealt in with it, I became much braver so it all has to come from me. My spiritual connection with my Lord and Savior is everything. That's the starting point for me. And it's been that a long way since 1985. And so you've got to be true to what's inside you. And those, those things will have voices, those pictorial images that you see. You might be browsing through an art book and then bam, something trips your trigger. Well, there's a reason why it is. It's pulling your heartstrings and you need to pay attention to that. And uh, so you might want to follow those things. Don't, don't let everybody else tell you what to do. You tell everybody else what you're going to do, then you do it and then you can tell them why you did it. I'm so grateful to be able to do this part of a, a little interview because this is one of the greatest blessings we've had at this wonderful home my wife Rebecca and I have is we had our uh, landscape guy build us this fire pit. And my wife and I spend several evenings out here and it's just human nature, the fire has in a controlled fashion like this has a very mesmerizing and a peaceful thing. It's hot and it's warm, but it's not dangerous. And I love being out here. Again, it's like plain air painting. I've, in fact, I've done uh, plain air painting of fire pit. Uh, 
So I really love being out here outdoors and, uh, and being around a nice campfire. Introducing C.W. Mundy, a highly sought after master landscape painter who has taken the classic technique of upside down painting and brought it current with his techniques, hints, and tips. When you turn the canvas and the photograph upside down, your brain no longer recognizes things and has to follow you when you're painting. It has to identify shapes, values, colors, your paint manipulation, and your edges. CW's method not only eliminates stress, anxiety, and hesitation in your painting process, but it also helps you develop your own style and approach to creating art. You're tricking your brain, which is a good thing, because it stops you from painting things. With Painting with Freedom, you'll learn how to create paintings that have depth, movement, and energy, and you'll have the freedom to express your unique artistic vision. Painting things can be an extravaganza of the mind going off and wandering off into areas and putting things in uh, that don't need to be there. When you experience painting upside down, you're going to find out how much fun it is. I mean, it is a blast. Don't miss this opportunity to learn from one of the greatest landscape painters of our time. Order Painting with Freedom today and start painting with freedom.